Hello and welcome to the debate with me, your host. Up next, what is happening with the Great Barrier Reef and is climate change exacerbating the problem? Introducing our guest today, Jake, a climate change expert, and Hayden, a member of the National Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators, a climate change sceptic. The Great Barrier Reef covers 2,300 square kilometres, roughly the size of Germany, yet 93% of the individual reef systems are affected by bleaching, and 22% of the coral crop of the entire Great Barrier Reef was killed. The event in question, El Nino, the irregular periodic warming of surface ocean temperatures in the eastern tropical Pacific. As you can see, there is a clear north to south gradient of severity of bleaching of corals. The red indicates 81% of corals that were severely bleached, the orange indicates 33% of corals that were severely bleached, and the yellow indicates 1% of corals that were severely bleached. Now, an opening statement from both of our candidates. Hayden? Thank you, Jack. First thing I'd like to mention is El Nino, it's a naturally occurring event. You see it every year, well, every two to seven years. And if we look back in the history of El Nino, you can see that the severity of, say, the 1997 and 1998 El Nino is very similar to the 2015 and 2016 El Nino. Well, we know that it did recover after that. I mean, yeah, there was obviously some bleaching left over, but that's going to happen. We know that this is going to happen, but everyone's saying that El Nino is being exacerbated by climate change. No, it's just occurring at the exact same times. It may just be occurring more often. This meaning that you can't, the reef can't bounce back like it does in the past. So there's going to be a slight more bleaching when the next El Nino event comes around. Thank you, Jack. Jack. In 2016, the Great Barrier Reef suffered the worst breaching outbreak since the records began, leaving only 68 out of 911 corals unaffected by bleaching. However, from 1998 to 2002, where the previous large-scale El Nino's occurred, only 40% of the corals were left without, ble uh, uh, without being affected by bleaching. Uh, so global warming must have had an impact on the severity of El Nino, otherwise more corals would have been impacted through buff, through buff stages. Okay, so if you look at it like that, there might be other factors. Think about it, if you think about coal dust and mining, that's obviously going to have a factor because it's going to make the water quality less. There's going to be more particles in the, in the ocean, there's going to be more sediment, less light coming through. Therefore, things such as the zoanophily would be less likely to like, photosynthesize. If that's occurring, then obviously they'll leave the coral. But what else could there be? There's other factors involved. Actually, mining only occurs in the south of the Great Barrier Reef, so there's very little impact on the north, which is where the worst coral bleaching events have occurred. At Hit Point in Queensland, the large deposits of coal dust has washed up on the shore, and still only 1% of the corals within that area are severely bleached. So as much as coral mining is a direct threat to the coral itself, it does not actually impact coral bleaching very much. Let's be realistic here. Thousands of climate models were simulated in, in a world without humans and their carbon emissions, and the conditions of the Great Barrier Reef that caused the current bleaching would have been virtually impossible without a human impact. In fact, the condition is 175 times more likely as a result of the carbon emissions that were caused by humans. Okay, so these tests, these simulations you said, they're run by marine biologists, correct? Yes. Okay, this is an election year, isn't it? So, what if these marine biologists are just using this? They're, they're using this to make people scared and put in, well, to fund themselves, to give themselves more funding for the next year from the government. So, really, they're just scaremongering, scaremongering and we need to run more independent simulations to see what's actually occurred and see what has actually happened. Well, this is a good point, because we want to be careful. We're talking about a resource that brings in 2 million visitors a year, a resource that contributes 6 billion Australian dollars to our economy. Okay, well, think about this. We know that this coalition government has put in $210 million a year into conserving the Great Barrier Reef. If they win the election this year. Yeah, okay. So, and they're also going to put in, what, 6 million for the Crown of Thorns? So... Yeah, that's good. The Labour, the Labour Party are going to put in 500 million though. But is it really needed this amount of money? I mean, well, this this isn't enough. If we look at 
a paper in May done by John Rose at James Cook University, he said it's going to cost us $1 billion a year to just get water quality to an adequate state by 2025. $1 billion a year. Well, you see, if you look at how much money was earned through the economy and through like all the people traveling, there's 2 million people that came to the Great Barrier Reef. Over 6 billion US dollars were earned per year on the, for those people. Can some of that be used of, uh, to be funded in to help the Great Barrier Reef and help the cause? Well, yeah, but surely that money is used for something else. Well, that's a valid point. I mean, the $6 billion that's brought in from tourism, right, that is spent elsewhere. That is the lifeline of Australia at times. I mean, look at the Seychelles. That is an example of a very effective coal management system where after 1998 El Nino, 90% of corals were destroyed. Since then, 60% have actually recovered. I mean, that is a real world application. Unlike your simulations that we spoke about early on, it seems to be, it, will, it does show how coal management is effective and how if we just used the right tools and knew exactly what to counter, then we would be able to stop and reverse coal bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. Well, those issues are pretty simple and direct. These are more complex. We've got issues such as <coughs> pollution, nutrification, sedimentation, not to mention ocean acidification. Obviously, the ocean absorbs 90% of our excess heat from our carbon emissions, which is uh, one of the causes, one of the leading causes in rising sea temperature, and therefore it's all obviously one of the main impacts to cause coral bleaching. Well, those are valid points, but those are the reasons we have the 2050 plan in place. That's a series of 151 steps to help combat everything that you've mentioned and to help increase its increase the reef's sustainability to increase its resistance to such events in the future so that future generations can visit the reef and enjoy it. This is more inclined to increasing the, dis the length of time that you can have tourism involved and therefore making the economy more stable in that sense. Well, while this seems physically possible, is it realistic? You've got political costs, you've got economic costs, I just don't think it's as viable. Well, if you look at the 2050 plan, 102 of the points are currently on track, 17 have already been completed. Only three of them are not on track, the others are still yet to be implemented. That's what it is. So there's no delay. The economic costs are currently being covered by the Australian government. They are the people that put this plan in place so it can succeed. So the coral reef and the Great Barrier Reef will be around for the future, for the sustainability of Australia. Well that's a valid point, but it sounds like every government plan has failed so far. And how can we trust the Australian Environmental Department after they asked to be left out of the UN report on climate change and world heritage? This led to Oceania being the only continent left out of the report. I think like everyone, we're a bit sceptical. That's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank our guests, Aidan, a member of the Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators, and Jake, our climate change expert. Until next time.